Welcome back. I've gotten a few requests to uh, show how to clean lever guns. Um, it's really, it, it really follows along the same uh, procedures as any other uh, gun that you clean, uh, but there are a few special considerations uh, owing to the, the way they're constructed, and we'll go through that. Uh, more than anything else, I want to kind of deflate some of the mystery that's associated with cleaning in all these cleaning series. Uh, I'll be talking about the same thing sometimes, and I may be a little bit redundant. For those of you who have watched some of my other videos, you'll hear some of the same things. But um, for, those, for, for the benefit of those who uh, just want to know how to clean lever guns uh, specifically, I'm going to go through those topics. So let's get right at it. Okay, let's take a look at some of the things that you should have on hand if you're going to be cleaning a lever gun. And some of these things are just the same as you'd have for any other firearm. One thing that's very handy to have is a, uh, is a uh, bore light. These bore lights, um, it's, just a piece of, it's just a piece of fiber optic plastic and they provide illumination up the bore so that you can see uh, what, what you've done and what you accomplished when you're cleaning. Uh, you can inspect your chamber, inspect inside uh, the gun very easily and get some light in there. Um, it's not necessary to have that. You can angle your thumbnail toward the light and you can see down the bore, but these are usually quite inexpensive. Uh, you need yourself a good nylon brush. Um, this is an M16 brush that I've had for quite a number of years, probably 25 or 30 years or more. Um, and you want to have appropriate uh, bronze uh, bore brushes in the uh, correct caliber. I'm going to be cleaning two lever guns today. One's going to be a 30 caliber 300 Savage and the other one's going to be my uh, 32 uh, Special, 32 Winchester Special Model 94 and along with that the appropriate size uh, cleaning jags to push through uh, flannel patches. Now these are just standard flannel patches. Uh, they're very soft cotton um, and they're, they're fuzzy flannel on one side and on the other side it's just uh, like you'd find on your t-shirt. Uh, I've, I've been asked <clears throat> by people if they can use uh, old uh, discarded t-shirts and things like that. There's nothing wrong with that. <coughs> Excuse me. There's nothing wrong with those materials. The only thing is that usually by the time we start tearing up our old t-shirts the uh, cotton is rather depleted and they don't they don't um, carry too much um, absorbency at that point. So for the for the um, uh, the gun the gear uh, Gun aficionado, I would recommend just uh, stocking up on a bunch of patches in bulk. And <clears throat> cleaning, um, cleaning oftentimes requires uh, getting into small places, so uh, a supply of Q-tips. I keep a big, I, I get the big economy uh, boxes that uh, have a, a couple of hundred uh, Q-tips, and I just keep them at my workbench uh, rather than raiding the um, medicine cabinet. And... Also, to a good, a very high quality, um, a very high quality uh, rod, cleaning rod of the uh, correct uh, size range. Now, this one here, this one here is sized for uh, calibers from about uh, seven, seven millimeter on up, and they make them in smaller sizes. But um, and then the other thing too, this is the uh, this is the boar snake. Uh, this happens to be a 32, uh, it's actually a 32 slash 8 millimeter bore snake. 32 and 8 millimeter is the same size, so if you're in a store someday and you can't find uh, 32 uh, size bore brushes, uh, look along the rack and you may find an 8 millimeter bore brush, and that's exactly the same size within a couple of thousandths of an inch. And <clears throat> also, uh, cleaning solvent. Now you're going to hear me talk about uh, talk about cleaning solvents and oils. Um, my preference goes towards. You can see this is just very, uh, very, very thin uh, solution. It's it's as Hoppy's number nine. Uh, I've used Outer's uh, cleaning solvent. It's a nitro solvent which has um, basically a uh, base that's designed to. It's, it's specifically designed to cut through. Uh, carbon fouling that occurs with uh, firearms and it will uh, clean it up very nicely or wash it away. Uh, you don't, um, I, I'm not crazy about, um, I have, as I've said before, um, I'm, you know, I, I've used Ballastol. Uh, it, it does a wonderful job of cleaning. 
but it, it also, it has right here lubricates. Um, I want the penetrates and I want the cleans, but I don't want to have the lubricates. The, the lubrication is something which is, this is an oil-based um, product, and uh, I'll, I'll discuss the reasons why I'm not too crazy about uh, using oil on firearms, especially with lever actions as we get into this. Okay, and uh, let's see, and with, with, some, with some cleaning rods, uh, you need to have an appropriate sized um, adapter because <clears throat> the Dewey rod, for instance, and some of the others on the market, uh, have a male threaded tip. And the reason a lot of people wonder why they have a male threaded tip when other cleaning rods on the market have um, female uh, threaded ends. Well, the, the male threaded tip allows you to use different adapters uh, to accommodate the many different um, thread patterns on the market because not all, not all thread patterns have uh, the same pitch and uh, diameter. So uh, this was with the, dif the different size uh, adapters that you can get for a Dewey rod. Uh, you're all set to go uh, no matter what brand uh, brush you, you purchase. So have, have a couple of uh, different sizes on hand with different thread pitches. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, it's a good thing to have. Uh, and a silicone, a silicone cleaning cloth. I should say, a, a, more of a, not so much a cleaning cloth, but a silicone uh, gun cloth, which uh, is impregnated with silicone oil. And this will uh, do a wonderful job of uh, preserving the outside of your uh, gun and uh, keeping the fingerprints from uh, corroding it. And um, finally, uh, oil. Now this bottle of oil is about six years old. Uh, it's still filled uh, about two-thirds full. Um, and I use it regularly, uh, but that's because the reason I the reason I uh, purchase uh, little tiny bottles of oil like this this bottle I expect to to last until I uh, stop shooting. Perhaps it, it I really don't use a lot of oil. This I use um, to place on a patch and uh, perhaps wipe down through the middle of my bore, and also to uh, just you know if I don't have a silicone rag handy. Uh, I can use that to uh, polish up the surface of the gun with a couple of drops. So that's it. Let's get right at it. Now, one of the most important things that any uh, gun owner should have on his workbench is a good 40-pound vise, uh, something that's solid that can uh, really uh, hold on to your gun while you're working on it uh, so that you don't scratch and mar it uh, and otherwise uh, bash it up. Um, as you can see here, uh, I've got some plywood calls. These are just three-eighths of an inch plywood that I fashioned uh, that fit over the, the uh, hump. And with this is this is my uh, Savage 99. And uh, this 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 particular gun right here, as you can see, it's got it's got really nice it's got really nice grain. When I first when I first obtained this gun. Uh, you couldn't see that green. All you could see was uh, just dark. Uh, it, it was very, very deep maroon uh, colored. It was, it was rather ugly. Um, I got this gun very, very inexpensively because uh, it was the stock was saturated with oil, and it was very unattractive. And as you can see right now, it's got a, it's got a very high grade luster, and uh, it's this is a thing of beauty. Uh, but it was all hidden uh, from view by copious amounts of uh, oil that had that had been uh, applied since uh, well this is a 1939 vintage uh, 300 Savage so what I'm going to do um, we'll talk a little bit about that but we'll wind this barrel in tightly and <clears throat> you see this is this is the way to go. I've used uh, all sorts of gun cradles. I've even built gun cradles. Uh, there's nothing like a solid vise. Uh, this, this vise can be uh, wrapped, the, those wooden calls can be wrapped tightly around the barrel uh, so that nothing moves. Uh, that, barrel, that barrel is absolutely secure and uh, will prevent uh, any uh, unnecessary uh, you know, burnishing of the barrel that might occur against other surfaces. And if you noticed, I put the 
I put the gun in uh, bottom side up. There's a good reason for that. And uh, let's talk about it as I uh, go on down the uh, gun here. One of the common problems associated with, uh, I should say, it's not a problem, it's a peculiarity. Uh, it's only a problem when, the, uh, when that peculiarity is not recognized and uh, addressed. And, um, but one of, the, one of the issues with uh, lever-action guns is that they have this long, uh, exposed inner surface of uh, open grain wood um, a, that's around the tang. In other words, this, this stock right here uh, wraps around uh, the gun tang, the upper and lower tang, and that's how it's secured to the, uh, that's how the, the stock is secured to the, the frame of the gun. The problem being is that when any of these, when any lever action is oiled, and uh, you know, we've, you've seen the uh, people who uh, love to, they, they have a fetish about oil, they love to oil the guns, the more the better, and they drop oil into any open crevice, that's an invitation to, that to them it says oil here, and they drop in uh, a half a bucket of oil, and, and they usually they change brands about halfway through, and then they go to a different brand because, you know, one is not enough, you've got to have two or three at least. Uh, so all these different oils go down in there, and then they, uh, then they, they put the gun away, uh, happy as a clam, and the gun gets stood up in the uh, cabinet, and all that oil drains down into the uh, grain of the stock. Now, when I first got this gun, I, as I said, uh, the, the wood was dark, muddy, uh, you couldn't see the grain, uh, and it was, uh, it, it, in some places it was almost black, and, in, and unfortunately, there were still places here where I could not get all the, um, where I could not get all the oil out. Uh, and there's still some darkening that's that's permanent. It's like tattooed. Uh, this this is tiger this is tiger stripe. This is not this is not oil. But there's some darkening around here, where for uh, for decades, um, for almost 70 years, uh, the uh, the gun received a lot of uh, unnecessary oiling and perhaps uh, solvents that got down into it. The uh, the process I had to use basically was to uh, dismantle the gun, and I had to soak this. I had to soak this stock for uh, three days in acetone, alternating with um, alternating with a heat lamp uh, to draw out the oil. And uh, for 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 two and a half days, every time I put a heat lamp to it, oil bubbled out of the side of it, just like it, just like it was fried chicken. It was actually bubbling out of the side of the wood. And uh, it, eventually the wood became nice and clear and dried um, as a furniture grade wood should be. Now let me say this. Um, you know, a guns are made of wood and steel, or steel and wood. Not all guns have wood associated with them, but uh, steel is steel. Uh, it, it's no different than the steel that's the, the hardened steel that's found in your toolbox. Uh, and the wood is no different than the furniture that's found in your living room. Um, you don't have to, it, it's, it's not something that you have to treat differently than uh, the other wooden articles and steel articles that you own. Uh, preservation of it requires, uh, you know, if, if, you, if, you stop, if you stop preserving it by doing things, you don't have to do anything actively to wood to preserve it. Your, your lamp table uh, sits in your living room year after year after year uh, through all different uh, you know times of the season when it's humid when it's dry and it lasts forever and is handed on down to your children and to their children uh, a gun stock should be able to do the same thing if you just leave the thing alone don't keep fussing with it and the same with the the same with the metal uh, the you know you you keep your wrenches in your drawer and you know many guys just throw the wrenches in the drawer and you know 20 years later they 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 pride themselves on still having the same wrenches they've never done anything to them maybe once in a while they've they put a rag to them to clean them up before they put them back in the drawer but they last that's that's the nature of hardened uh, steel so you don't have to obsess about it um, the thing to the thing to remember is that hardened steel doesn't require uh, any attention. It just it just simply requires uh, that it be kept clean, uh, clean, and you can wipe it down with you can wipe it down periodically with uh, you know a lightly oiled 
cloth or silicone rag but you don't have to oil just because there's a hinge you don't have to oil it you don't have to oil places where there's holes and you certainly don't want to get uh, oil into the wood where it's going to do exactly what I explained happened to this uh, precious gun by the way this 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 gun here is one heck of a shooter um, it has bewildering accuracy um, the first day I got it I I had loaded up some uh, 150 grain Sierra bullets with 40 grains of 4064, and I'm not recommending any particular loads, but you really can't overload the 300 Savage case with uh, 4064 powder. It, it it fills up before you get to any high pressure. Um, but I, I that that particular load uh, with this gun will shoot half inch groups, even with and and you know uh, I've talked about um, sights before, but sights don't make a make a gun accurate or inaccurate uh, a gun is the the sights are only the instrument by which you point it to the uh point it down range uh but this gun is this gun is uh fired uh several half inch groups uh and quite a number of three quarter inch groups um it it's a it's a phenomenally accurate gun so if you if you have the opportunity to ever get uh, a a model ninety nine savage especially of that uh vintage uh, when they when they still had the um, tooling brand new, uh, you know you can't you can't go wrong. They come in the old 250 Savage, 250 3000, and um, and the uh, 300. Those are the two those are the two primary calibers that they were made in that that are probably the most popular. But let's get back to the cleaning of it. Now you notice that the gun is upside down, and that's exactly because. This rounded, this rounded receiver on this Model 99, we'll bring this up a little bit closer, um, but that, that rounded receiver right here, uh, that acts like a, that acts like a, uh, a collection tray. Uh, any, any oil uh, or solvent which is passed down into the bore uh, will gather and collect inside that uh, closed receiver, and there's no place for it to, to uh, escape. Except from the uh, except from the underside, the the uh, uh, ejection port, uh, the loading and ejection uh, area at the top of the uh, receiver. So, what you want to do is you want to invert the gun so that when you pass uh, cleaning patches down through, uh, which have solvent on them, that any residue from solvent and and uh, gunk uh, drops out through. And that's another thing. That was another thing that I. Uh, discovered when I first got this gun. When I broke it down and uh, dismantled it down to its component parts, the inside of this gun uh, looked like a uh, it, it looked like a an engine that had not been cared for. Um, all that oil uh, that had been used through the years had accumulated like an old uh, in, like an old engine, um, and it was like an old engine sump and the. Um, the receiver was completely full of thick, uh, tarry uh, grit and grime that had had been mixed with oil through the through the years. And this gun came from Alaska, by the way. Um, this this gun came from uh, Anchorage, Alaska, and one can only uh, ponder uh, how many heads of game, uh, magnificent game, that this gun has uh, uh, been. Uh, Involved with through the uh, through the through the years, but um, uh, I I spoke to the um, I spoke to the uh, dealer who uh, sold it to me uh, on the phone, and he knew the he knew the gentleman who owned this gun, and he said that he was indeed uh, a hunter that uh, hunted a lot with it. And I can see right here the evidence of the evidence of a gloved hand uh, having worn down this uh, bluing rather thin. So it's it's a remarkable gun with a I think a remarkable history. So let's get to uh, cleaning it. Before I begin, let me just uh, answer a question that's floating around in your minds out there. Um, I have a uh, I have a um, boar snake sitting on the bench, and you're probably wondering why I'm not using the boar snake right now. Well, I I will, and I'll discuss that. Uh, boar snakes are a wonderful uh, field instrument uh, to clean guns, and I believe that. You know, for the, for the average uh, lever action owners are not, they don't historically have uh, a lot of uh, interest in shooting a lot of uh, ammunition. And, uh, you know, a boar snake would probably be sufficient for the average, uh, for the average lever action shooter. And it's a good way to, uh, it's a good way to clean a gun. But having said that, um, 
the arise those of us who uh, shoot frequently and uh, you know the the heat associated with uh, firing uh, does cook uh, the various uh, elements inside the gun and uh, it gets into the pores and it requires a little bit more strenuous cleaning than you'll be able to accomplish with a boar snake. A boar snake will um, get an, an awful lot of the uh, carbon residue out and if, and if it's the only thing that you have available uh, it's certainly it's certainly uh, better than uh, doing nothing for the gun. So if you want to just if you want to just get one of those and stick it in your pocket and uh, take it to the range with you, that's that's fine. But if if you want to get down and dirty and get a real uh, get a lot of the uh, cleaning accomplished that you wouldn't otherwise, uh, then you really need to do it with the more traditional methods. Now let me say this: <clears throat> the crown. Everybody uh, should be aware that the crown of a uh, firearm is uh, is extremely important to its accuracy. Any any microscopic uh, dings and chips in the uh, edge of the uh, where the where the edge of the bore is, uh, as it, it this area right here is called the crown, and that 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 leading edge of the bore, uh, if there's any chips or cracks in it or uh, any kind of imperfections, uh, it will act like, act like gas porting, and as the bullet comes out, it rather than the gases emitting. Uh, 360 degrees around the base of the bullet all at once, uh, they'll they'll jet out of that small little recess and it will kick the it'll kick the base of the bullet over and cause it to yaw and it will uh, disrupt its flight. You can have incredibly uh, poor accuracy with a gun that has um, an imperfection to that uh, crown. So we're not forgetting the need to uh, preserve that crown. But I don't want you to obsess about it. Uh, remember that this is high-grade steel right here. This is not this is not baloney, and this this does not uh, this does not really. Uh, you don't have to worry about it. What people do is they sometimes they they stick the gun on the floor of the truck as they ride down the road to the next uh, to the next shooting spot, and the crown bangs against the floor and the dirt from from off their boots and everything, and it causes a problem. But with with just reasonable care, without obsessing about it, uh, you can you can keep that crown uh, intact using uh, using a good cleaning rod uh, without any concern. So don't don't obsess, don't worry. Uh, I, I want in all things with guns, and this this is going to be a theme that I carry throughout everything: cleaning handguns. Uh, you know what what to do and what not to do. Most of the time, don't worry. Um, you know, be not afraid. These these are not these are not uh, you know delicate instruments. They're very very rugged. These guns are made to um, uh, you know accept tremendous punishment. We don't want to abuse them, but they do accept tremendous punishment. So what I'm doing is I'm putting on my uh, adapter, my threaded adapter, and I'll put my um, I've got a, also to, I forgot to mention, uh, a good thing to have is a, you should have a bore swab. This is, this is nothing but, uh, cotton, uh, flannel wrapped around, um, you know, a, a wire, and it, these will last forever. You don't really have to, uh, you don't really have to replace these. Uh, you know, you can every now and then toss it in the, uh, you can toss it in the dishwasher or something like that and, and give it a cleaning. But um, basically just put that on there. And I want to take some... I've got my Hoppies number 9. And I'll see if I can swing over. And I'm just putting... If you can... See if I can angle this so you can see what I'm doing. Just put on... Wet it. You don't have to. You don't have to saturate. You want to avoid saturation because saturation causes all kinds of purging of uh, fluids that that end up uh, in places that you don't need them. You only need to wet the bore. Uh, these nitro solvents are extremely efficient and they they get to work very quickly. And they, they basically you just want to wet the bore to uh, allow it to to get into the uh, to get into the um, carbon fouling that's uh, inside that barrel. Okay, so the main thing is now uh, to just guide it with your fingers carefully. 
uh, so that you so that you're not banging into the end. It's not it's not fragile. It's a it's a crown, but it's not fragile. I don't want you to I don't want you to think that 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 crown is just going to uh, deteriorate because you're passing a uh, rod down through it. And as I'm entering the as I'm entering the crown, just watch and be careful. Keep things concentric so they're not bashing. Just want to avoid uh, you know avoid. Uh, just malpractice in, in dealing with your gun. A lot of a lot of, most of the problems are associated with people who just uh, you know they're, they're bulls in a china shop and they just don't uh, they don't take care of what they're doing. Just run it in all the way through. You can you can see the the rods going in until it comes out the other side. Now with a uh, lever action, you you could if you wanted to unscrew that uh, unscrew that bore swab. But I'll just I'll just draw it right back out, and that's it. And I'll remove it. Um, that's all I need to do with that swab. I don't need to uh, run it back and forth any number of times. Next thing is we take our 30 caliber 30 caliber brush, and you should always use the correct size brush, and never ever ever use uh, stainless steel use stainless steel brushes. We're not concerned with the life of the brush. Uh, we're, we're concerned with the life of the bore and uh, you don't want to use anything that has the same hardness uh, as, as the steel, the, bore, the gun steel itself. You want to use something which is um, softer and bronze is, bronze is the traditional material which is used for uh, brushing gun steel because uh, no matter how many passes you make down the bore, this, this bronze, brush, bronze bristle brush is not going to uh, affect any change to the uh, bore and it's not going to scratch it. Furthermore, uh, nylon bristles, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're a waste of money. They're worthless. They really don't. The, the individual bristles are far too coarse uh, to, to get uh, into the cracks and crevices deeply in, in the corners of the rifling. Um, and then the other, the other problem is, is they simply aren't aggressive enough to, uh, to loosen up any uh, embedded particles. The other thing to watch for is your bore brushes should have a rounded, uh, protected tip. Um, some don't. Some of them are some of them are cut off at the end, and that can do some damage uh, at the other end. And it can and, and that's where you can sometimes cause problems if if that should encounter the uh, the bore at the crown. And you don't want to you don't want to hit your 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 uh, the back of your receiver. So again, just carefully insert it. And when it gets to the uh, unions there, when it gets to the junction, just pass it through gently. And, and also, too, this, this cleaning rod is plastic coated, so there's, there's a marvelous surface here. There's nothing here that can do any damage. You want to keep that, keep that surface clean. So what I'm going to do is pull out a, um, I've got my Scott rags in a box, and these these are wonderful. Um, so as I as I bring the as I bring the rod back through, uh, I just make sure I keep the uh, keep the rag on it to keep the uh, residue off the off the rod. It's that residue on the rod that can cause some problems sometimes because that will that will form a abrasive um, abrasive coating on it that can do some damage. And I just run it all the way through. Now, how many times to uh, run it through the bore? Uh, a good tight bore brush should be run through. Uh, the rule of thumb is uh, once for every shot fired, but really not much more than uh, 20 or 25 times. You're not going to accomplish anything more after 20 or 25 uh, full passes back and forth. In other words, that's like 20. You know, it's like 20 times. That would be 40 strokes uh, back and forth. And the remember, my action is open, so the you know anything anything that's coming out through the uh, chamber end is falling to the floor. Um, I can angle it so that all the all the residue falls to the floor. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend that we've gone through 40 passes through the bore back and forth. And okay, so now I'm just gonna simply take my uh, my patch and saturate it lightly with with solvent. It doesn't have to be dripping wet. Uh, as long as it's as long as it's fully wetted, that's all that we need to do. 
you don't want to create a mess that uh, dribbles in places that you, you, your only objective is to get fluid on the the surfaces of the metal you don't want to have too much uh, running all over the place onto your onto your bench uh, you know for one thing it's a waste of money uh, you paid good money for that solvent so use a little bit of stewardship in your products and they'll last a lot longer and again feed that through so that you're not hitting the the crown there's no worry there I'm just feeding it all the way through now I'm gonna this time catch it okay now we've got a patch that now we've got a patch that just has that uh, greenish color there's no more there's no more carbon fouling so the the hoppies did his job of getting the uh, carbon fouling out I'll put one more uh, wet patch down through each of these patches is wet now because all I'm doing is I'm uh, washing out I'm washing out the bore I've scrubbed it remember with the bore brush so all the scrubbing has been done now all I'm doing is simply passing wet patches through and this washes the bore out and as you can see uh, I had loosened up there a little bit so make sure you keep that tight you don't ever want to lose your uh, cleaning tips or your jags inside your barrel you'll have a you'll have a heck of a problem if it ever gets jammed in there without without the rod attached to it so pass it in Okay, beautiful that's exactly what I want um, and now I'll have I'll have people uh, concerned that I'm not that I'm not taking care to remove that so-called copper fouling well it's I'm, I'm gonna repeat myself again uh, that's not copper that's not detrimental to accuracy uh, that's copper oxide that's not that's not copper buildup there's no uh, the, the 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 copper gilding metal has uh, basically filled in, spackled that board, just like you'd spackle a wall uh, before you paint it. It's basically filled in the imperfections inside that bore uh, that were created when it was, uh, when it was, the rifling was first cut. The scratches and striations that we see uh, as a police investigator, we look in, we look in a bullet comparator and we can see the, we can see the uh, microscopic impressions that are left by uh, the, the cutting tools that were used uh, on on these uh, barrels. So it's filling in it's filling in the potholes. It doesn't it doesn't build up on the high surfaces. It only fills in the potholes and it smooths out the barrel and is what I call conditions the barrel. Uh, and that's a good thing. Conditioning a barrel is exactly what you want to have. Uh, in in effect. It's, it, it has it has almost the same effect as uh, lapping a bore. If you if you condition a bore by smoothing it out uh, on the negative side, it's the same thing as um, it's the same thing as uh, if you uh, cut off the high sides. So uh, don't worry about that uh, copper oxide, that green color. That green color means that there's just simply uh, the bore is conditioned. There's no. It's just as absolutely smooth inside as can be. Uh, so we've accomplished the job of cleaning all the carbon residue out. Now I'm going to follow up with one or two. It probably is only going to take one or two uh, clean patches passed down through to completely dry it out. And I'm going to let that patch and there we go. That's That patch is, that patch is almost um, it's 80% dry. I'm going to do another one uh, just to make sure I've got it dry. And again, check my tip and make sure that that has not loosened up. You know, I'm I'm talking as I'm going through this and, and taking my time, but in real time, this would only take 
this would only take just a few minutes. I, I don't expect to take more than uh, 10 or 12 minutes to clean, uh, clean a gun uh, in this fashion. So uh, this is not a, this, you know, this is really not much more difficult than uh, cleaning a gun with a, um, this, it doesn't take that much more time than cleaning it with a, a boar snake. A boar snake is very handy to have, but uh, it doesn't save you that much time. Uh, and this way here, you're getting the gun uh, absolutely clean. So that's it. Finally, now, now that I have a completely dry bore, um, I can take I can take a, a couple of drops of uh, oil, and this is this is really the only thing I use oil for. I put uh, you know one one drop at each corner. That's all I need to do, and I don't need to saturate that patch. You can see it's one drop at each corner, and that, believe me, that'll apply uh, a considerable amount of oil to the inside of that bore. And let me say this: um, you know, if you if you have a uh, if you have a humidity controlled uh, environment that you uh, keep your gun in, say in a safe uh, with a golden rod, you get that patch and make sure it's always recover your patches. You don't want to find that a patch has gotten into uh, your action so that you can see that patch that went through the that went through the bore uh, with the oil it came out uh, absolutely spick and span it's, it's it's clean as can be that also stops the oxidizing in other words that that uh, the, the the oily patch will uh, in passing down through will halt the oxidizing process so that it basically stabilizes things um, but you don't really ha there's no uh, there's really no need uh, these days to concern yourself about oiling the inside of a bore. Um, that harks back to an older uh, time. Uh, before the 1950s, uh, there were uh, corrosive primers, mercuric chlorate, uh, salt, salt and mercur mercury primers that were extremely corrosive, um, and they they attacked the metal uh, almost immediately after firing, especially if if it was humid conditions, uh, wet conditions. Uh, it was like you having salt water inside your bore. Um, but we don't have corrosive primers any longer. Those are well, unless you unless you're buying some uh, ammunition which comes from uh, third world countries. In some cases, we can you can still get some of that stuff or old Soviet block uh, ammo. Um, that that ammo can sometimes be uh, corrosive. Corrosive primers uh, required the use of uh, hot soapy water. Typically, that was the that was the cu customary standard method for uh, for cleaning a bore. Was to uh, at the end of at the end of the day to uh, get out a hot soapy uh, water bucket and uh, flush the barrel out, almost as if you were in, in much in much the same way that you had to clean a uh, black powder uh, muzzle loader. So. Uh, we don't have that situation anymore unless you're using that kind of ammo, uh, and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, a, a couple of drops of oil inside the bore is good to uh, prevent uh, that, you know, to, to basically stop that oxidizing the green, the, the green color. But that green color doesn't change the accuracy of your uh, bore in the least. Uh, and if you keep the gun in a uh, humidity-free uh, zone, uh, you don't really have to worry about it. Nothing's going to happen. These are not delicate. I, I just want to keep on mentioning that stuff. Um, there's, there's no need, just because you own a gun, there's no need to all of a sudden go out and buy all kinds of things to uh, coat it and, and to soak it and to, 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 do, to grease it and all this stuff. You don't need to do anything. Uh, just keep it clean. And, and now when we, I'm going to talk about um, the mechanism again. Take this, take this out. Uh, this is this is a place where you can get all kinds of junk in there. Uh, you want to keep it clean. Uh, you don't want to have you don't want to have attracting uh, oil. Uh, oil is oil has got a uh, fascinating um, heritage in just the last couple of years online. Uh, everybody everybody wants to use uh, more oil than the other guy. Uh, one guy will write on a blog. Uh, I use I use uh, mobile. Uh, one synthetic on my gun, and another one will write back, oh, I, I use STP on mine, and then another, another guy will say, well, I make a mixture. I use, uh, I use some of my mother's, uh, you know, hair dressing and put that in there, too. You know, you don't need to install a dressing. You do not want to 
uh, put any oil inside that action. You see, <clears throat> this gun operates uh, just as good as you can possibly expect it. Every round will cycle through this magazine and into the chamber and eject itself without any hindrance, and it doesn't require oil to accomplish that. This is not a reciprocating engine. This is not an internal combustion engine. Uh, there are no there are no zerk fittings attached to this. This is not a this is not an axle. Um, there are no places that the manufacturer of this gun uh, endorses or recommends uh, placing oil. And this this counter right here, just because it looks like a convenient place to put a drop of oil, uh, that you should not be putting oil into that little counter. That's simply a place that you can see uh, how many rounds are left in the window. Um, this, again, you know, you, you, sometimes you have to look at the evidence. Um, when I cleaned this gun out, it was completely impacted with uh, crud. Uh, the gun was still working, f you know, because it, it's just the way these guns are made. They're, they're well made, and it worked despite the fact that it was filled with crud. Uh, but nevertheless, once I cleaned out the crud, uh, that's the last time it's ever going to see crud, because uh, it, it doesn't have any oil in it now to attract any... Uh, residue. Uh, powder residue is not going to fall down in there and uh, get embedded. You know, one of the biggest friends that you can have, uh, you know, is just the, the local the local gas station with, with a uh, air hose. Uh, just go down there occasionally, or if you have your own compressor, uh, just set it on 15 pounds. Don't, don't go crazy because you don't want to be, you don't want to be spinning things around in there. Uh, but just you set it at 15 pounds and, and blow out, blow out the action. Uh, that'll get any uh, primer or powder residue out of there and keep it clean. There's nothing inside, there's nothing inside this gun. This is not, it doesn't have any openings to, uh, it's, it's a closed breech. Once a cartridge goes inside there uh, and, it, and it's fired, uh, everything goes forward. Uh, the only, the only, um, the only dirt that you're going to basically find in there is uh, you know pieces of pine cones and the other things that go in there when you're hunting um, But for the most part, you know, you, you keep that gun closed up uh, when you're hunting and uh, you, There's a minimum minimum amount of uh, junk that's going to accumulate. So don't worry about it. Uh, be not afraid uh, This this gun will always operate no matter how many times uh, you cycle it uh, If I if I want to wear my hand out sitting It's not going to heat up and start melting. Uh, you know, I can't I can't fire that fast enough uh, to to cause it to uh, deteriorate. Uh, the barrel is going to wear out. If if you if you live long enough to wear the gun out, it's the barrel that's going to be gone uh, from overshooting. Um, you know, the, every gun every gun has got a certain life built into the barrel. Uh, with with a gun like this is rel relatively low intensity. Uh, it, it fires around 42,000 uh, pounds per square inch uh, loads. So it's relatively low intensity and it's a it's a relatively uh, open bore uh, compared to its uh, case capacity. So this gun could probably fire uh, this gun could probably fire many thousands of rounds without any effect on the on the um, rifling the lead of the rifling up in here right in front of the right in front of the chamber but you know with some of the rifles that uh, that you guys have uh, even 223s you know you you fire that's a relatively high intensity cartridge that's that's uh, especially with your NATO stuff it's up around 60,000 pounds per square inch with the NATO version of the 223 uh, versus the 52 and 53,000 so that with that kind of intensity um, you've probably noticed that you're the head stamps on your 223 uh, is one thing, but the head stamp on your NATO stuff after you fired it, usually you have flattened primers. Uh, sometimes the primers fall out when you try to reload them and, and you know, you chamfer the, you chamfer the, um, the primer cups and they, uh, they, they don't even stay in because there's such, there's such a uh, high intensity load. Uh, so that stuff, that stuff will burn your barrel out long before, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to wear out the action, okay? Keep the, keep the lubrication in your, in your engine, but don't be putting it into the, into the 
uh, gun. And I don't care what anybody online says. Uh, I'm speaking with, I've been shooting guns for 55 years. Um, and this is, the, this is the way I've always treated them. I keep them dry. They always work. They never fail to function. Okay, so let's move on to a 94 Winchester. So just a couple of things that you want to watch with those. Okay, here's my uh, Model 94. Now this, this gun is uh, this gun is a 1950 uh, vintage Model 94. It's a 32 Special. Um, it shoots great. It's a uh, fabulous uh, shooter like a lot of 32 Specials are. Um, it's a fun gun to load for and it's a fun gun to shoot. By the way, if you, if you have a 32 Special and you can't find ammo for it, uh, and if you're a hand loader, you know, you can use, you can use 30-30 brass. You just have to make sure you segregate your stuff, but you can use 30-30 brass by running it into a 32 Special die and it will simply open it up that extra couple of thousandths of an inch and uh, give, you the, give you the brass you need. They're the same, they're the same parent case, they're 3855 uh, brass, that's how they started out, uh, neck down. So uh, you can use, you, if you can't find 32 special brass, you can use 3030 uh, brass, that it has to be upsized. That does not mean you can fire 3030s in a 32 special. Don't confuse that issue. Uh, you can only shoot in any gun, only shoot what's marked uh, as the chambering marked on the barrel. Never ever substitute ammunition in one gun or the other. Uh, it really won't fit anyway. They've, you know, manufacturers have been pretty clever through the years. That's why we have the uh, SAMI. They, they uh, make sure that uh, when a 3006 has been necked down to 270, they change sh shoulder angles and things like that to make sure that one cartridge isn't accidentally or inadvertently placed in another. There are a couple of exceptions to that rule. Uh, eight millimeter Mausers have uh, have uh, been fed into 3006s and have blown them uh, skyward. That's not there are there are certain cartridges that uh, can be uh, unfortunately mixed up uh, to to result in big problems. Now with this with this particular gun here, I want to show you the most common um, oiling point uh, on this gun. Walk right up real close, and you can see right over the Right over the loading port, there's this there's this hole right here, and you see that everybody knows that hole, and that's where they they stick the uh, because it, it fits the oil spout of a uh, you know three in one oil can, so they they run some oil in there. No, 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 no. That is that is called the that is an access point for a drift pin. On the other side of the gun, you'll see right here, there's a screw. That is the finger lever stop pin, uh, finger lever pin stop screw. That's the finger lever pin stop screw. Uh, if you remove that, if you remove that screw, then you, it gives you access to the finger lever pin, which is pushed out uh, with a, with a drift pin on this side through this hole. This is not this is not a place to put a zerk fitting so that you can run grease in there, and it's not a place where you uh, where you fill it up with oil. You don't you don't charge it up with oil. But you know a lot of guys do that. Uh, you might think it's a it's a laughable thing, but a lot of guys think that when they see a hole like that, that the, the manufacturer thought it was like the uh, you know on a Daisy BB gun. You know you've got a you've got a place up here. It says oil here, uh, you know written around the written around the hole. That's not the case with this. That's not. You know, they get a Daisy BB gun, and then they're, they're, the next thing they buy one of these, and then they say, oh, there's, there's my oil hole. Don't run oil in there. Keep it dry. Now, with this gun in particular, this is not a handy-dandy gun, uh, you know, for the, for the kitchen top, uh, kitchen table top um, gunsmith. Um, it really is not a gun that lends itself well to, um, you know, taking the, taking the action apart. Uh, the screw, the screws, um, the, the screw, for instance, the, the screw right here, which attaches the, um, the cam, the lever, uh, and the finger lever, uh, that, that is staked in, in, in position. And the reason why it's staked in position is because the manufacturer does not intend for anybody to be removing it. So it's unlike the Model 336 uh, Marlin, which, uh, you know, you can, 
you can take the bolt out the back by simply removing the lever, you know, the finger lever. Um, this is not made to do that, um, and, I, and I really discourage anybody from uh, tearing down a, a Model 94. Uh, it, requires, it requires a little bit uh, greater, un greater understanding um, than the average person uh, can acquire. Uh, and with these, the, the best thing that you can do, if you've got one of these that is badly soiled inside, uh, remove the stock. That you can do. Uh, you, just, you just simply remove the uh, tang screw right here, and that, that, that stock, uh, just slide it right off, and, and do not twist it off. Uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen a couple of clowns on TV uh, on YouTube that in order to loosen it, you know, they whack it against the side of their bench, you know, real manly stuff. And then they have a, then they have one of these cracks that runs down through here, and uh, the next poor guy, uh, you, you know, he doesn't have a gun that he can shoot because he's got a, he's got a completely ruined stock. Uh, so, slide the stock off uh, very, very gently. Uh, if it's stubborn, uh, just you know, take somebody else, take and, and hold the barrel, and you pull straight, but always straight with a capital S. Make sure you get that off, and don't don't wiggle, don't pry, don't don't beat on it, don't do anything. It will come off. Uh, but once you've gotten the once you've got the wood off, and you you can you can remove the uh, fore end by removing this removing the screw here. Let me say a word about that. <clears throat> a lot of guys will take that screw out and then they see that it's bent and they, they, they're worried uh, that somehow the, the screw got damaged. Uh, the screw was bent purposely by the uh, smith at the factory, the gunsmith who fitted this gun together, purposely put that screw on a uh, block and whacked it with his uh, ball peen hammer to put a bend in it to keep the screw tight so that it doesn't uh, unravel itself from the other side. Uh, it, it makes a nice tight fitting screw. So if it's, if it's got a little bit of a bow in it, it was placed in there intentionally by the gunsmith at the factory uh, to make sure that it stays in place. The, the fore end of these guns should click a little bit. They should have a little bit of, that's the way they're designed. They should have a little bit of free movement uh, that keeps the that keeps the barrel band, uh, the stock barrel band, from binding against the magazine tube and barrel, uh, which can cause inaccuracy. So you should have you know a little bit of a little bit of play also in the fore, in the fore end, I, I should say in the front barrel band. That's perfectly all right too. There's nothing wrong with a little bit of play there. If if, if it doesn't if it doesn't have it, you don't have to concern yourself. The, these are not these are not bench rest rifles. Um, they will shoot adequately accurate for the distance that they that the cartridges were intended to be fired. Um, you know, don't expect these things to be shooting MOA. Uh, if you have one that shoots uh, phenomenal accuracy, you you've got a gem. But uh, don't don't be don't be worried if the other guy is shooting you know two inch groups with his and you're only shooting three and a half inch groups with yours because that three and a half inch group is really all that this gun was ever intended to shoot uh, to begin with. But once you've gotten the, the wood furniture off of this gun, then you can take uh, the gun and you can immerse it. Uh, if, if it's really gotten some uh, you know, serious crud, you can immerse it in uh, acetone and, uh, or even kerosene, and you can flush it around and then blow it out with an air hose. Make sure you get all that stuff out because you don't want to have that... that that can travel into places and then you have yourself a, a volatile mess and plus you don't want to have that stuff bleeding onto the furniture when you get your uh, stock back on. If you've, uh, if you've done all that, if you, once you've got it all cleaned out, uh, then uh, just simply wipe down things with a, with a lightly oiled rag. All you want to do is just simply apply uh, a, a, a microscopic coat. You don't want to have uh, you don't want to have visible oil you, because if it's visible oil, uh, dirt sees it too, and dirt will cling right to it, uh, and it causes a problem. So you want to have you want to have a dry gun inside. Dry is good. Okay, don't worry about dry. Dry is good. This gun again, I can sit and do that until my fingers fall off, and the gun's not gonna it's not gonna wear out, and it's not parts are not gonna start flying out. This is all hardened gun steel. Okay. 
when you clean it, do the same thing as you did with, as I did with the Model 99 Savage. Clean it with, clean it upside down, uh, grasped in your in your bench vise, and uh, that way there all your all your uh, junk will fall directly out of the it'll fall directly out of uh, the chamber. You don't want to have that stuff dribbling down and getting into. You don't want to have uh, loose uh, liquids getting onto your linkage because you know after you're gone uh, and the gun's sitting there in the safe or in the corner of the room, uh, that that stuff is dribbling down and gravity is bringing it right right here and you've got uh, 13 and a half square inches of open wood right here and that that wood uh, will really uh, accumulate a lot of um, solvent and oil very very quickly so keep keep it dry and this gun here is in pretty good condition because apparently the the guy who owned it prior to me uh, was very conscious of uh, perhaps he perhaps he just didn't worry about uh, his gun he just left it as is uh, and and which is a good thing uh, he didn't he didn't subject it to any oil so the, the wood is the wood is pretty clear uh, as it was the day it was purchased uh, as the day it was made so that's all I have uh, I want you to just have a good time shooting shoot often as you can and God bless <laughs>